Hello, my name is Dr. Carol Gentile, and I'm a psychologist at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. I work in the outpatient service there, and I have for about 30 years now. This is a talk on parenting an anxious child. So I'll start off talking about anxiety, anxiety disorders, and then get into the treatment of those disorders and specifically the role that parents can play in that process. What is anxiety? Well, one of the ways of understanding anxiety is to compare it to a smoke detector, but a smoke detector that's far too sensitive that signals danger when in fact there is none. And so as a consequence, sometimes a smoke detector goes off and there is danger and we feel grateful, it's good that it, we were warned. But most of the time, the overly sm sensitive smoke detector goes off causes a lot of commotion and noise and fear, and there was no danger. Now there's one big difference between our faulty smoke detector and children's anxiety, and that is that when a faulty smoke detector goes off, and it happens in all of our homes, we look around, we assess the danger, we note that the batteries need to be changed, and that we just fan it, we go about our business, we don't sort of run screaming from the building. With anxiety, children cannot readily perceive whether or not they are in true, true danger when that signal goes off. And as a consequence, it's very uh, typical for us to note that children over time increasingly avoid situations that they associate with this feeling of discomfort, anxiety, fear in the absence of danger. So they become vigilant, they become uncomfortable, they become suspicious, they wonder why they alone are scared and no one else is, um, they feel different from others, they lose a sense of their own ability to protect themselves, and they view the world as being sort of hostile, predatorial, they become focused on preventing even the most remote type of danger, and they might even think that their faulty smoke detector keeps them safe. Okay, so if all of that is true, what is anxiety? Well, it's a feeling of apprehension and fear in the absence of danger. Now, an anxiety disorder, different, um, is when that, those feelings of apprehension and fear in the absence of danger become chronic. Okay. And those feelings don't quite fit the situation, are extremely distressing, and mostly, mostly, mostly functionally impairing. So those three elements have to be there for us to begin to consider an anxiety disorder. Let me say a few words on how common those anxiety disorders are. And this sort of illustration is intended to show, well, one out of seven children at one point in their lives, about 15, 20%, somewhere in the middle, will perhaps be diagnosable or could be diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. So in an average classroom, 28 kids, you'll have maybe two, three, one child who could have been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. Now only a portion of those children actually seek out care, one in six. So in some ways, already, if you're watching this video, hoping to sort of know how to help and support and treat your child's anxiety disorder, you represent a subsection of that sort of group of people. Now, what we've experienced since about 2008, 2009, is anxiety disorders are becoming more and more prevalent. So it's, a, it's not an uncommon problem that we encounter. So maybe that's our first take home. Everyone has symptoms of anxiety, we all know that. An anxiety disorder happens when those symptoms are chronic, they don't quite fit the situation, they're functionally impairing, and they're causing a lot of distress. In this next section, I wanna talk about the different components of an anxiety disorder, because there are some, and it'll be important for later in the presentation because it maps against our treatment of anxiety disorders. So let's look at that. Anxiety has different components. 
These are them, emotional, cognitive, physical, and behavioral. Now, in terms of emotions, um, it's intuitive. Anxiety is associated with fear. So children become fearful, but there's more to it than that. They can also become sad and defeated. They can be embarrassed and ashamed of themselves. They can become even angry and combative. So the feelings can be broader than just the fear that anxiety causes. Anxiety and thinking styles tend to be associated with one another. And when we talk about it later, we'll talk about those kind of thinking errors. But these are some of them. Focusing on shoulds and musts. Overgeneralizing from negative situations to other new and new, potentially neutral situations. Catastrophizing thinking that everything is the end of the world, jumping to conclusions, um, overlooking positives, focusing on the negative and possible dangers rather than safety cues, and mostly, mostly, mostly imagining the what if. So what if this? What if that? What if the other thing? Um, looking for danger cues out in the big world. In terms of the physical reactions that are associated with anxiety, they too are numerous. So you can imagine, and if you're a parent of an anxious child, you've seen this, racing heart, hyperventilation, labored breathing, muscle tension, dizziness, uh, feeling hot and uncomfortable, and having an upset stomach. So final component, behavior. Anxiety tends to elicit certain kinds of behaviors. Now, the, the hallmark of anxiety is avoidant behavior. That's what we see mo most often. In fact, sometimes if I'm wondering, could there be an anxiety disorder and I see a lot of avoidance, certainly that's a red flag. There are other behaviors that tend to be associated with anxiety and some of them are a little bit sort of counterintuitive. So fighting, becoming combative and uncooperative can be um, sort of a symptom of an anxiety disorder freezing, escaping situations in which you're uncomfortable. So that tends to be the pattern of behavior. Now, before we go uh, forward and talk about those different treatments, the things that I did, said at the beginning, I think it's useful to ask yourself the question, well, if there's a difference between anxiety symptoms that are universal, it's part of our humanity, and anxiety disorders, on the other hand, um, how much anxiety is too much? And so, consider these three children we're, as an illustration. So we're going to consider these three children and say that they are preparing for a math test. And they are preparing for a math test on which they have exactly the same ability. Right? So, one of the, the child at the top looks serious but not crippled with anxiety or fear. The child at the bottom on the right-hand corner looks much more sort of concerned, worried. And then there's that goofy little guy who's kind of devil-may-care attitude. So before I show you the answer, consider this question. Who would you expect to do best on that math test, assuming equal ability? Okay, so we actually know the answer to this. So, of the three children, the one who is most likely to perform well is the child who is at the top, the little girl, serious, but not crippled with anxiety. And what does that tell us? It indirectly answers the questions that, that I pose. How much anxiety is too much? Well, none is not enough. None is not enough because anxiety kind of revs us up and orients us to care about outcomes and do well. So it's not inherently all bad. Too much anxiety is crippling to the point that when you look at the illustration in terms of the relationship between anxiety and performance, just one aspect, but still very informative, what we find is those people who do best in their performance are those who have a moderate level of anxiety. Children who have no anxiety do, and children who have a lot of anxiety, actually their performance is similar. So the child who very much cares about the result of the math test is actually so hampered, 
so sort of handicapped by their anxiety that they're performing as if they didn't care. So the relationship between anxiety and performance, um, if you took psychology courses, is what we call an inverted U-shaped function. Moderate levels of anxiety are actually okay. And it's a good sort of note to self because when we're treating an anxiety disorder even, we're not looking to eliminate all forms of anxiety. We're not looking to eliminate all symptoms of anxiety. We're hoping to decrease distress and to optimize functioning and to get kids to cope with their anxiety. So how do we pull this all together? And I'll come back to this model over and over again because it's really helpful to understand how these pieces, these moving pieces, all work together. So if you consider the model, this is a way of explaining how kids develop anxiety and how it's maintained over time. So one of the things that we know um, first box is that children who develop anxiety tend to have, be more sensitive than those who may not develop anxiety. And what we might mean, psychologists, uh, mental health practitioners, what we mean by anxiety is someone for whom feelings come more easily, that the feelings are stronger than might someone else, that they stay longer than someone else, and it takes longer for them to recover. So that's our definition of sensitivity. So you're imagining a more emotional child, emotion is triggered more easily, those emotions are bigger, they stay longer, it takes longer for them to recover. Okay, so a sensitive child will be more vulnerable to developing anxiety. Some of those sensitive kids have also had past experiences that were scary ranging from trauma on the one end of the continuum to just adversity on the other end of the continuum, which all humans experience. So now we have a sensitive child who's had past experiences that were difficult. So they go out into the big world that they often, we've already said, experience is predatorial. So the instinct is to try and predict future problems and solve them before they happen. And so what are they doing? They're looking for danger cues. They're looking for the problems that might occur. They're looking for hypothetical problems that have not yet occurred. And that becomes a habit of the mind. Okay, so now we've got our second piece. We have a sensitive child, had past scary experiences, who now is going out into the big world, developing a thinking style, looking for all these problems before they even happen. Initially, that's great. Maybe we would say he or she is prepared. But over time, it almost is a lens through which they see life. And so they're focusing on negatives instead of positive, and they're, they're actually making those thinking errors that we talked about earlier. Okay, so now they're thinking in this way. They're going out into the big world, and if they're presenting to a group, who are they noticing? They're noticing the kid in the third row who's on his cell phone instead of paying attention. They're noticing um, the child who said to them, new genes, you know, that could be ever so slightly negative. They're noticing possible signals of danger, right? And when you look for those signals, you find them. They're out there. And once you find them, your body sends you those signals to yourself, starts to react, all those sort of physical cues, almost like the alarm that's ringing, we're in danger. And so it confirms the way you were thinking of things. You expected problems to occur, now your body's signaling to you, we are having problems. And in response to that, that bubble, that circle there, in response to that, it is very common for children to understandably want to avoid, escape, or freeze in situations that are beyond their comfort zone because they interpret that to be dangerous. That starts off, too, as a solution to a problem, to avoid things. It works 100% of the time. If I didn't want to do a presentation, or excuse me, if I was anxious about a presentation and I didn't do it, there's nothing to be anxious about. If I was anxious about a math test and I didn't do it, there's no reason to continue to be anxious. The difficulty with avoidance, though, 
is that it works perfectly in the moment and not at all in the medium and long term. What happens in the medium and long term when you stay within your comfort zone, when you don't rise to the challenge, when you don't do difficult things? Well, actually what happens is you increasingly feel ashamed, different, dependent, incapable. And then that feeds into your vulnerability and you become even more so. So it's very common for us who diagnose anxiety disorders to have a child who started off as being maybe shy and sensitive, who became sort of ever more pessimistic, focusing on the what ifs, um, perhaps ever more withdrawn and avoidant, and then defeated, sad, embarrassed, ashamed, and that cycle gets worse and worse over time. And the kids, no longer can do the brave things that they used to in the past because they're so preoccupied with feeling safe. In fact, they're so preoccupied with feeling safe that it becomes ever more elusive, that in fact they feel less and less safe. So what can we do about it? Well, we have um, evidence on the last 50 years of research on the treatment for children and adolescents. And this um, article that was published in 2016 summarizes that. So let's start there. What does science tell us we can do about an anxiety disorder? So this graphic summarizes the components of potent treatments for anxiety disorders in children and adolescents. So in other words, let's take the best treatments for anxiety disorders in children and adolescents and let's see what are their common features. What are they doing that's effective? And so that's sort of along that kind of axis, uh, vertically naming the components of good treatments. And what do you notice? At the top of that list is exposure. Now already should make sense to you because exposure is opposite to avoidance that we know is so critical in moving from sensitivity, anxiety, to an anxiety disorder, to a chronic anxiety disorder. So if we do the opposite of avoidance, which is exposure, that's really a powerful treatment. You can already imagine the difficulty. Yeah, but avoidance was a solution to the problem. And that's right. That's where the tension comes. We want to expose children to, to things outside, slightly, their comfort zone. But you have to remember that for them, that constitutes a problem. That's the opposite of their way of coping with anxiety. Okay, so let's explain how exposure can be that powerful. Why would it be that powerful? So if you look at this graphic, it shows repeated exposures, repeated confrontations with something that's outside your comfort zone. So you're actually approaching something that you're afraid of. The first time that it happens, your anxiety goes way up and then it recedes over time. And in fact, that pattern is repeated over time. But let's look at what happens the second time you do that thing that frightened you. Presentation, whatever, going to class, things like that. The next time it goes up again, recedes, but it's not going as high, it's not lasting as long, and so forth and so on. Third time, same shape, goes up, doesn't go as high, and then recedes. And what you learn Adults learn, know that already. I'm going to feel uncomfortable if I stay there. If I buy time and stay there, my anxiety re will recede and, great, I'll have a sense of having overcome my discomfort and anxiety. And that is, in fact, how we build competence and resilience and confidence. So let's look at that same sort of sequence of events. If we avoided and escaped. So, first time you're trying something super difficult, your anxiety goes up, and let's say you ran. You, you got out of there. It was, I was beyond my comfort zone, I had to leave. 
what would happen? Well, this is not happening. In fact, the next time that you would be exposed to that thing that you fear, the prediction is it would go up longer, up longer. It goes in the opposite direction. So when you avoid something, you're doing the opposite of exposure. You're confirming your fears that you were in danger, and you're, you're not allowing yourself to rise to the challenge, to do difficult things, to get evidence that might have suggested to you that your way of thinking needed to be adjusted, that it was incorrect. That's what happens to anxious kids with an, or kids with an anxiety disorder. Okay, just a, a cute cartoon that a colleague of mine found, which is credited at the bottom. <laughs> Um, so, just a funny way of constructing it. If I avoid everything scary, I can stay home and be safe, but it's not a great life strategy. That's essentially what we're talking about. Okay, so if all of that is true, what role do parents play? Well, you play an important role. And let me explain that. Parents can unintentionally find themselves reacting in ways that falls into the red bubble, falls into the avoidance bubble. And let me explain. When children are afraid, it is often instinctive for parents to protect them from, air quotes, the danger. We're mammals. That means we're attached to our kids. We want them to feel safe. And that's appropriate if they were in danger, right? Or it can even be appropriate if it was a moment of danger. But with an anxiety disorder, you already know, it's chronic. If you're chronically doing that, protecting them against perceived dangers that in fact are not real, we're actually sort of reinforcing that avoidant kind of response. So with anxiety that is chronic, that is exaggerated, that's distressing, the instinct to protect, to reassure, to run interference is very counterproductive. As normal as it is, it still is counterproductive. And when a parent sort of protects a child from their unfounded fears, we actually give the child the message that you can't cope, honey. Um, they're, where you're only safe when you're with me. And their fears are based in reality. Your fears are based in reality. We also deprive them of the opportunity to figure out difficult stuff on their own, which is how most people learn. So when children have parents who do a lot of that, and we call that accommodation, and I'll explain that term a little bit later, they might not be motivated for treatment, which would have been difficult anyways, because remember, we're pitting against their avoidance solution to exposure for the purposes of eventually getting better in the medium and long term. In many ways, treatment exchanges their short-term solution for more kind of medium, long-term sustained solutions. Okay, so what is parental accommodation? Let me explain that. Parental accommodation is the ways in which a child's anxiety affects his parents, his or her parents. The ways in which parents respond to their anxious children differently in the hopes of reducing fear and discomfort. It's often different than the ways in which they thought they wanted to parent. It may even be different than the ways in which they parent their non-anxious child. It's intended to make their child feel safe. But we already know that that's a double-edged sword. Okay, so what does it look like, this parental accommodation? Well, What's always struck me clinically as, as a psychologist is it can look very different in vi different settings, very different across homes. But often it kind of has this feel. So you're giving a lot of reassurance as a parent. You're walking on eggshells. You're run, running interference, speaking on behalf of your child, doing on behalf of your child. Um, 
in a way that kind of doesn't feel quite appropriate to the child's age. You're rigidly, rigidly scheduling every aspect of family life. Oftentimes sleep routines are long and complicated and lots of parents actually sleep with their kids. Um, you're often checking, checking, and checking again that your kid is okay. Texting, calling, there's lots of contact with the parent when you're not around. You might even be asking siblings to behave differently towards the anxious child. Um, you're refraining from normal family activities. Sometimes you're taking kids out of school either entirely or in response to panic attacks, discomfort, upset. So let me um, explain parental accommodation a little bit more. When we study children with an anxiety disorder, what do we find? Well, we find that 90% of their parent, their parents, so parents of anxious children, 90% of parents of anxious children are accommodating at a really high level. And that's what this graphic is intended to show. Um, Nine of those blue-faced families are accommodating a lot. Maybe one out of ten is not. And what does that tell you right off the bat? It's normal. It might not be what's really indicated if you were to step back, but it's a normal instinct. It's a normal reaction to accommodate a lot when you have a child who's kind of terrorized by their own anxiety. That's normal. The difficulty is, it's normal, but it predicts poor outcomes. So, it, it also gives us an avenue for treatment, because what can happen is if we manage to shave down parental accommodation, decrease it, we can actually have an impact on children's anxiety disorders. And that's been a new area of research um, that I'll sort of give you the reference for a little bit later, that gives us an avenue into treating these dis anxiously disordered children um, in a different and new way uh, that's also potent. So let me give you an example of parental accommodation in that sense of the term, and hopefully it'll illustrate uh, what we're talking about. And I've told this story so often, I can't remember if it's true or if it constitutes a composite. But the story goes as follows. You have a little boy who's anxious, who is afraid of the dark. So when he's in the family room in the basement with his family, he's afraid to go upstairs to the washroom. His dad is really skilled, so what does he do? He installs motion-activated lights. Brilliant. Okay, so initially what the little boy does, great leaves the family room, goes upstairs, the lights go on, problem solved. But he's not maybe an average child. He's one of those sensitive children that we were talking about. So that works for a little while, and then this happens. He realizes, yeah, but the lights are on, but I'm alone up there. I need accompaniment. That's the second tier. So now, lights go on, but he needs to be accompanied. That's the next tier. That works for a little while. And then he realized, I'm accompanied, the lights are on, but when I'm in the washroom, I can't see my air quotes bodyguard. Oh, third tier. And so forth and so on and so on, to the point that now the air quotes bodyguard needs to be in the washroom with him. And the last step is the air quotes bodyguard needs to be in the washroom, standing in such a position that if at any given point in time the child could look in the mirror and sort of verify that his protector is there. What's interesting about this story, and it's a common thread with these stories of accommodation, is it starts off intuitively. And then all of a sudden, in trying to offset that worry, that fear, that sense of danger, what actually happens is this child now feels more danger. This child perceives his own home as being dangerous. This child now feels that like doing something as simple as going to the washroom when your entire family is in the security of their own home requires protection 
And that's a common pattern that we see with parental accommodation and children's anxiety. This, so the author that I'll talk to you about talks about accommodation creep, like it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, always intending to secure a feeling of safety and well-being, but actually producing the opposite. Okay, so the author, Elusive, um, is Leibovitz, and this is um, a, psycholog a psychologist from the University, uh, Yale University in Connecticut, and he's written books on this topic, and he studied it extensively. And the book in the middle of this is um, the one that was published in 2021 is just really very accessible and well written so if you had to choose one book I'd recommend that and I had a lovely mom in some of the groups that I give for families who had said to me Carol it reads like a Chatelaine article and I thought that was the most com biggest compliment that uh, she could give so if you're interested in these ideas that are new and evolving in our area um, this area of study, then you can sort of look at these books and get some more ideas. Okay, so what do we want to do with this parental accommodation? Well, focus on parental accommodation requires a bit of a kind of shift in thinking because all too often when a child is suffering, has an anxiety disorder, the, the thought is to want to change the child. But again, you're now realizing we're trying to remove from them unhealthy ways of coping, avoidance, and exchanging it for facing their fears, which is pretty much a hard sell. So with the focus on parental accommodation is we actually we want to shift our gaze to kind of focus on what a parent is doing that unintentionally is reinforcing that pattern of anxiety. And we want to dismantle that. So we're trying to change a parent and not necessarily change the child. I mean, that'll happen downstream, but our first sort of object of study, consideration, and intervention is the parent. That's difficult. I know that. But... Um, it's often easier to change the self than it is to change someone else. So as difficult as it is to change your own reactions to your child's anxiety, it's still easier than trying to change your child's reactions to anxiety because avoidance has been reinforced, right? So it, uh, these interventions are kind of neat because they allow us to intervene when children are too young or have issues that prevent them from participating in therapy or simply when they don't want to, they're not cooperating with therapy. And it also allows us to change the environment in which they live, which is really powerful. So they get to practice these new skills that are emerging all the time because they're in the backdrop of their lives has shifted if we manage to change parental accommodation in a really planful and gradual way in a smart way so sometimes when i talk to people about accommodation the reaction is oh so overprotecting is bad i'll just demand independence and it's not that simple in fact we're trying to find the sweet spot between protecting them and demanding independence. And it's the middle ground is where we want to sort of position ourselves. Some parents instinctively are more overprotective. Some parents instinctively demand more um, independence. Some parents, when their child develops a disorder of any type, will kind of improvise their reaction. <laughs> Um, all of that is normal and is certainly a pattern that we observe. But what we're really trying to do with these interventions is find that sweet spot. Neither erring on the one side nor the other, because neither is kind of indicated or helpful. Neither is healthy coping. So... Why would we do that? Because children get a sense of their own abilities by doing difficult things. Now with anxious children, sometimes what we want to do 
is give them the confidence that they lack. Give them the courage that is sort of missing by giving them kind words, encouraging them with our love. There's nothing wrong with that. So that's fine. Except that it doesn't stand in isolation. If they're also not seizing the opportunity to do difficult things, if they're not sort of nudging their way outside their comfort zone and having new experiences that, that involve learning, then they won't build a sense of their own resilience. So by doing difficult things that are within their reach, they will develop a sense of resilience and confidence and all those wonderful things that we so desperately want them to, independence as well. So let me explain the difference between, accommodation is usually a nice word, right? Uh, the difference between maybe helpful accommodation and not so helpful accommodation. So helpful accommodation is moving a child towards independence. Oftentimes it's meeting them where they're at and then nudging them forward, sort of like the Goldilocks principle. That's helpful accommodation. So if your kid is here on any given scale, whatever, you're kind of there. And then as they move forward, you inch them forward. Note that we're not just treating them as average children and saying, catch up. This is not, no longer access, acceptable. That would be the error of those that demand independence when they learn about uh, parental accommodation. It's kind of this graduated, gradual process. So examples, choosing a recreational activity that's in line with the children's interests and abilities, requiring steps to towards independence that are within reach. That's helpful accommodation. Unhelpful ac accommodation, well, common thread is you often see the word avoidance, right? You're avoiding all recreational and social activities because the child prefers that. You're not requiring that the child do age-appropriate things, like for example, contributing to family life in a way that's okay for their age. You're requiring siblings take on more than the anxious child. So all of that kind of does this, has them not sort of being able, not being required to do things that they're capable of doing. And that is the kind of accommodation that we want to target and begin thinking of differently. So let me tell you a little bit about how in fact we do decrease accommodation. Well, the mantra, the, the, the big thing in that area is to do it gradually and purposely rather than inconsistently in an improvised fashion that's sudden. Now those are words that are easy to say, difficult to do. The advantage of doing it in a purposeful, gradual way is that you have a bit of a game plan. And in the absence of a game plan, what are you going to do? Well, we're all humans. You're going to have a day that you're tired. You're going to have a day that your child was really upset and you revert back to maybe some of those unhelpful forms of accommodation. So really, you want to kind of approach this strategically. You want to kind of be smart in the way that you do this. And the art of this is to try and find the gradient that you're moving along, right? So it's kind of nudging your kid along rather than doing it more kind of an improvised way. I had a mom who said the following to me that I found so helpful. She didn't have a plan, so she did it her way, but she said the following. I find myself understanding these ideas just pulling back a little bit. That was for her, her first step. Just pulling back, taking stock, hesitating before she went in there and tried to make it all better. And that was really good. Okay, so now we're on our second take home. Take, it takes a while to get to number two. Um, the first is that there's a difference between anxiety and anxiety disorder. Anxiety is not all bad. We need it. It revs us up. An anxiety disorder is treatable. And so those are the circumstances where this anxiety is chronic, doesn't fit the situation, distressing, functionally impairing. Okay. The second take home is that parenting a child with an anxiety disorder is different than maybe parenting a child who is not. 
If I go back just to the anecdote, the um, example that I gave earlier, if that child who was afraid of the dark had not been super sensitive, it would have just been a fun experience. It would have stopped at the motion activated lights, and it didn't. Um, and so that's the benefit of hindsight. Okay, so before we move forward, I want to say a few words about validation because that is the foundation of so much of the treatment that we do, whether it has to do with anxiety disorders or not. And let me explain that. Why would that be super important validation for a child with an anxiety disorder? So the anxious, sensitive child is more reactive, more emotion, requires longer time to recover. And because of those things, they can be subject to more criticism. Not criticism, I mean, it can happen, but not criticism necessarily in the form of you're bad and this is embarrassing, but criticism in the form of sort of getting feedback from those around them that their, their perceptions are incorrect, that they're exaggerating, that this is ridiculous, it's fine, don't think about it, it's nothing, don't worry about it that there's nothing to be afraid of. Are you still thinking about that? Or let me do that for you. So when we think of validation, invalidation, oftentimes we kind of think to ourselves, oh, invalidation is really mean-spirited. Not necessarily. Sometimes invalidation comes in the form of sort of um, trivializing someone else's problems, not seeing the world through their eyes, and giving them a whole whack of solutions that are prepackaged, like one after the other. Well, did you talk to the teacher about it? Did you say it? that kind of stuff, rather than hearing them out and giving them a sense um, that feelings and thoughts are okay. Now, it's especially important, another reason, with anxious children, because anxious children tend to do this. They are uncomfortable with their feelings. They tend to be avoidant. Put those two things together. They avoid thinking about their thoughts. They avoid thinking about their feelings. Their feelings are different than those of, of people around them. And so they kind of don't understand their own feelings. It's never echoed in the absence of validation. They don't see signals around them that says, you know what, it makes sense that you're afraid. It's okay and you can do difficult things. So validation is super important. It means that I get that I am about to ask you to do a difficult thing, and I believe in you. Not trivializing that everyone else your age can do it, so you should be able to do it too. That's not the message that we want to give them. So what is this wonderful validation that um, mental health practitioners make such a fuss about. It's simple. It's elegant. It's a recognition that a person, their feelings, and their thoughts are valid. And it translates into greater collaboration, greater flexibility, greater cooperation. So it's really important. So how do we uh, validate? Well, this is just a a simple little graphic that kind of explains it. It doesn't need to be fancy. It's simply giving the message to the child that you're interested in their thoughts and feelings and that their thoughts and feelings make sense. So it can kind of sound like, well, it makes sense that you were upset about this, that, or the other thing because. Now what it's not is giving simple solutions, or giving guidance, or making it all okay. Because then, if we were to do that, we're back in that little circle around uh, over-accommodation and avoidance, right? So validation, for those who might have noticed this, is really the building block of independence and mastery. And again, same words, we're doing the opposite of the instinct. Okay, there's a little video from Brene Brown, which is just lovely, in which she uses the word empathy, but really what she's talking about is validation. We don't need to tell her that, but, um, but it's the same kind of difference. And it'll give you a sense of how come that's really important. And actually, I would say to you, as parents who are human, we know how powerful validation can be for us. When we have people around us who get us, 
who don't trivialize our problems, who see the world through our eyes, who give us a message that we're okay. So, third take home. Anxiety disorder, you already know. Parenting a child with an anxiety disorder different than maybe parenting a child who doesn't have an anxiety disorder. And before you start anything, practice, hone your skills in validation. It's a really powerful tool for motivating change and for connecting with your kid. Okay, having established that, we can go back to the model because there are other components that can be the object of study. And for those who remember the beginning of the talk, that was a while ago, we can, we can target sort of thoughts, behavior, feelings, all those kinds of things. So let's start off with the bubble on targeting vulnerability. So how do we decrease vulnerability in a child who's sensitive, who may have experienced scary things in the past? Well, oftentimes we decrease vulnerability through healthy living. It matters. It really does. And maybe one good way of thinking about it is that the sensitive, anxious child doesn't have the luxury to live an unhealthy life. They need to be, they and their families need to be thinking of exercise, sleeping, healthy home lives, and for some, even they would consider medication. So I'll walk you through that. How do we decrease vulnerability through exercise? Well, um, there's mounting evidence that just being physically active is associated with mental health. There it is. And this is a graphic from the Canadian 24-hour movement guidelines that were published in 2017. And what it's, in, it's an infographic. It's intended to show what should an average 24-hour day look like in a child's life. And it's a little bit sobering to look at the details. Mostly, you're sleeping a lot. You need that. You're sitting a little. Um, you're moving your body about, and you're doing intense exercise. That's what healthy living looks like in terms of the distribution of hours. Um, and you can look at some of the details of what those components, what those ingredients involve. And that is confirmed also in this study that um, is from 2018 that showed that, and the graphic is intended to show like healthy brain comes from having a healthy heart and body, basically. That, and I have a colleague with whom I do some of these workshops, a psychiatrist, Lisa Johnston, who often says to people, exercise is the first frontline intervention for children and youth with an anxiety disorder. That's a really powerful statement. Moving your body, being physically active, has some mental health benefits. So what we know from these studies is that more than half of Canadian kids between 5 and 17 years of age are not getting that kind of active, healthy lifestyle. And if you remember what I said at the beginning, um, we're seeing more and more of these anxiety disorders. So you can't help but sort of draw a link. And filming this during the pandemic, um, we know that that's been especially true of this difficult period. So what does physical activity actually do? do? It does wonderful things. It improves cognition, thinking and learning. It helps with brain function. It helps with emotional, psychological, and social well-being. So it's really a potent intervention. So what can we do if you're a parent listening to this and you're like, yeah, but. And the yeah, but kids like their tech time. So what can we do to kind of shave off tech time, bring it even remotely close to those two-hour guidelines that were described in the previous sort of infographic? Well, there's probably five things that you can do. It's an oversimplification, but it's a start. You can set limits on your own tech time. You can be a good role model. Put your phone down around dinner when you're together with your kids. That's a powerful message. Um, make sure that there's no technology in a child's bedroom. There's a lot of good reasons for that. 
encourage your child to play organized sports, but know that that's not enough. They also have to be physically active. How are fi kids physically active? They play outside, they contribute to the household sort of chores, stuff like that. Great that it also cultivates independence. And you encourage your child to do physical activities. Now here's another way of decreasing vulnerability. We're still first in that top bu bubble, right? Sensitive, anxious child who's had previous scary experiences. And now we're trying to decrease vulnerability. There's kind of four ways that we can do it. Exercise being one. The other that you can sort of target is sleep. Why would that be important for anxious kids especially? Well, there's some research that shows that a lot of children with an anxiety disorder also have sleep problems. They wake up more frequently, they have later bedtimes, they have difficulty falling to sleep, they have poor quality sleep, and they have difficulty waking up in the morning. And in fact, it's even more interesting than that, is that the degree of sleep problems are associated with the degree of anxiety problems. So less sleep, more anxiety. So what can we do about sleep? Um, well, sleep is habit-driven. So routine is super important. And oftentimes I'll say to families, you know, does your child wake up at the same time every day? And they'll say, of course they do. They go to school. But they're talking about the five days of the week. They're not talking about the weekend. On the weekend, it's like they're shift workers, totally different schedule. So when we're talking about routine, trying to reestablish good sleep habits in an effort to reduce sort of sensitivity, what we mean is more or less the same wake time throughout the week. We, mean, we often also mean bedtime rituals that involve mild distraction and relaxation. We mean no screens around bedtime, because that's not a good, great idea. No naps. We mean moving your body so that you need sleep and really remembering that the way you fall asleep is the way you fall back to sleep during the night. And why do I mention that in the context of anxiety? Because lots of families are lying down with their anxious children to get them to fall asleep. And what happens when they wake up a little bit in the middle of the night, the way normal people do because it's rhythmical, they realize mom or dad are not there, they then get up, go into their parents' bedroom, go wake up mom and dad so they can fall back to sleep. And that's where the quality of sleep is disrupted. And you know what? It's the quality of sleep not only for the child, but also for the family. So now people, just imagine it, everyone's sort of functions more poorly when they're tired. So now we have an anxious, sensitive child, in fact, a child with an anxiety disorder who's not getting good quantity, quality of sleep in a home where neither are, are his or her parents. Okay, still trying to decrease vulnerability. One of the things that we know about households in which children do well is that there's a certain sort of style to those families. Um, and it is warm and responsive. And it's a home environment in which, you know, we use positive reinforcement more than punishment. We encourage independence and autonomy. Those are words we've used before. Uh, and we show compassion and respect, empathy, validation for the child. And if those are not the words that you would use to characterize your home, moving in that direction can be super helpful. Now, when we talk about medications for anxiety disorder, obviously the first thing that should be said is that is a serious decision that should be discussed with the treating physician. And it's not something that I've seen my colleagues use with milder cases. But sometimes when children are moderately to severely disordered in their anxiety, it can be an important sort of part of the solution. And this is a handout that's produced by the Canadian Pediatric Society. They have a whole series on caring for kids. And associated with this handout that's intended for parents, it's on the use of SSRIs to treat anxiety and depression in children and youth. They have accompanying documents if you kind of want to dig deeper. 
um, you want to sort of inform yourself, but you also want to use good sources of information to kind of have an intelligent discussion with a training physician. Okay, we're finished the first bubble. Now we've decreased vulnerability. What else can we do in terms of the model of anxiety? Well, we can actually work with those cognitive errors that kids make um, when they look out into the big world. Sort of focusing on shoulds and musts. I mentioned them before, the what if, the what if, the what if. Well, how do you modify that? How do you encourage more flexible and realistic thought? Um, We can't tell them their thinking is bad because that would be, right, going back to invalidation. We want to be more strategic than that. One thing that we can do is to sort of externalize the anxiety and say, you know, that's, I think that's your anxiety talking. It tends not to be realistic. Uh, we talk about how anxious think, thinking exaggerates fears and is often bad at predicting the future. So if they're catastrophic and they expect really bad things to happen and they don't happen, we want to pay attention and show interest in the fact that, hey, that was off. Like, The first day of school, you said nobody would like you, and here you are on day number three, and it looks like things are going well. I guess your anxiety is not very good at predicting the future. Um, And we want to encourage the kids to think things through and check out the facts. Okay, other aspects of the model? Well, calming that anxious body. Those two bubbles that have to do with those kind of internal and external responses to anxiety because they can really hijack the situation. And one thing that you can do is kind of integrate into your daily life some kind of calming activity. Um, That's really helpful. If kids, even something as simple as going back to their breath and breathing deeply, and calmly and slowly, um, that can be super helpful because when their body does kind of, you know, have those really strong reactions, they have a strategy for calming it back down. Now, helpful tip, pro tip. Oftentimes parents are trying to do that in a moment of anxiety. So they're trying to calm their anxious child's physical reactions, but only when they become anxious. But think about it, that is not a situation in which you're learning new skills. If you want to use those skills of calming down the body, what do you have to do? You have to practice them every day when you're not upset. Because when you are upset, we're humans, we have to make emotions, you're not thinking too clearly. That emotional mind is sort of hijacked the situation. So if you're expecting them to calm down, breathe deeply, focus on the world around them, get grounded, Um, weather the storm of an anxiety or panic attack. We have to teach those skills much more consistently every day if they are to use them when they're upset. And it's a good idea. Okay, we're nearing the end. I wanted to say a few more words about something else that can be in that bubble, in that round avoidance bubble. And that is something that I hinted at before, combative behavior, non-compliant behavior, fighting. It is not impossible for an anxious child to also be non-compliant. That can happen. It can happen because it happens. It can also happen because the anxious, sensitive child has been so avoidant over time that now they've gotten themselves to a point in their development that they're really the demands of their life are outpacing their ability to respond to those demands. And they honestly do not believe that they can do it, and everybody's treating them as if they should be able to do it. So they fight us on it. So there's a few things that you kind of need to consider when you're dealing with that. And the first is, before you even start anything more complicated, is I would say to you, Consider if there's any hidden rewards to having an anxiety problem. And what do I mean by that? Because maybe some parents will say 
to themselves, are you kidding? There's nothing good about an anxiety disorder. And I agree. But there can be hidden rewards. And they look kind of like this. I don't have to do... Well, I've had all sorts of examples of this. I don't have to do gym because I'm uncomfortable with gym. But was that a sufficient reason not to do it at all? Perhaps we needed to ask how you could do gym. Um, my mom sleeps with me when I feel really bad. When I'm out of my comfort zone, I spend the day in the resource room. My parents pick me up at school early whenever I'm scared. There are hidden rewards, oftentimes associated with an avoidance of having an anxiety problem. And we really want to dismantle that sort of system. We don't want to sweeten the deal for anxiety. Okay, so now we're talking about a non-compliant sort of anxious child. What can we do? Well, one of the things that you can do is pay attention to what you want to see. It's a simplification, but it's true. Um, and the donut is intended to be an analogy to that. This is um, an image that was used by Tamar Chansky. Chansky. I'll give you the reference later on in her book, and it's lovely. And what she's basically saying is pay attention to what's there and not what's missing. So if you're having problems with compliance, when your child does comply, you want to pay attention to that because your attention is still potent. It's reinforcing. Thank you for, for putting the lunchbox away. I appreciate it. That's what we call independence, whatever. Pay attention to what you want to see. Too, too often, when we have problems with non-compliance, it draws our eye to those problems. And we forget to reward, to punctuate, to pay attention, to highlight, to underline those things that we want to see. We want to sweeten the deal on that and kind of manage non-compliance effectively. Um, again, my colleague um, Lisa Johnston has this catchphrase that she used which I love, which is praise the best, ignore the rest. <laughs> okay, something else that you can do with non-compliance, you can actually actively reward bravery and compliance. And it can be a simple system like a mason jar reward system. And I appreciate that for older kids, th this wouldn't work, but the principle is still the same. So you want to direct your attention and reinforce compliance and then kind of exchange it for something that's extra. And that's an easy place to begin. What are those other books that I mentioned? Well, I mentioned the Tamar Chansky book, and she has a really lovely way of writing and all sorts of kind of analogies that can be used to bring the child into this solution and explain anxiety to them. So that's an easy read, and it's a nice place to start. There's another book that's really good, and that's for kids. Um, and it's what to do if you're, you worry too much. There's actually a series in that. And this author is really interesting because she began to write these books because her kid had an anxiety disorder. And uh, fun fact, when the books became really popular, she was invited to do all sorts of presentations. She realized that she had an anxiety disorder too. So it's kind of neat. It's neat to know that people can write this stuff from a position of, just knowledge, but also a lived experience around it. And then we in Canada, we have the Anxiety Canada website, which is brilliant. It has like a children's corner, a youth corner, parent stuff. It really is nice, simple, uh, but accurate kind of explanations of different concepts. So that's your fourth take home. <laughs> Review just to be consistent. We know what an anxiety disorder is. You understand that parenting a child with an anxiety dif disorder can be different than parenting a, a ch child who doesn't have an anxiety d disorder. Validation, good stuff, is really key. And there are a lot of other ways that you can kind of help your child with an anxiety disorder and kind of provide a little bit of scaffolding to the changes that are to come. In terms of thanks and recognition, well, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't thank the children and families with it, whom I have worked for so, so many years, who have taught me about um, strength, perseverance, and courage, resilience. I'm forever grateful for that. And there's a few colleagues I wanted to thank, 
who helped me with an earlier version uh, of the talk and gave me feedback on it. And they are Heather Bragg, um, Claire Nesh Matsoi, Matso, Stephanie Greenham, and Janet Oles. Thank you for your time. <laughs>